Good afternoon, everybody. How are we feeling today? Do I have some radical people out there? Where's my resistor family? Are we ready to say impeach this? Dickerson, one of the board members for Women's March National, but I also say that I am standing with all of my family, which is you. I want to offer my sincere gratitude for each of you all that are here standing in solidarity with us today and saying that we're going to continue this fight. From last year, we have continued to say that we are demanding justice that we are going to reclaim our courts, that we're going to continue to seek for reproductive justice, for racial justice, and racial equity. Let me ask you a question, and this is on a personal platform. Do you love black women? I said, do you love black women? If you don't, why don't you? I just want to call up some of my friends and colleagues from the Women's March so they can greet you and we're gonna keep this going today. But please keep this inten in intensity, this energy, and we're going to make sure that we get these people like rapists out of the Supreme Court. Are you with me? <laughs> Remember, we believe women. We believe Dr. Ford and we believe Anita Hill. Are you with me? Thank you. My name is Rinku Sen. I am one of the two new co-presidents of the Women's March. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you for turning out today and for everything you did last year. I don't know about you, but I have still not forgotten about Merrick Garland. Yes! I have not forgotten about the sham investigation of Brett, of Brett Kavanaugh that landed him on the Supreme Court. We deserve better. The women of the United States deserve better than a bunch of corruption coming down from the top of our federal government. Movements like ours have reshaped this country again and again over almost 300 years. Our resolve and faith and energy is what is going to protect this democracy from corruption for us Definitely for us, but also for our children and for their children. I'm so proud to see you all here. Women's March stands with you. We stand together. We don't forget, and we keep fighting. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. So many of your faces we saw last year. My name is Rachel Carmona. This is the second year that most of us are here to, to protest. Brett Kavanaugh's sham confirmation and his disgraceful presence as an associate justice on the Supreme Court. Before I go much further, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, it's that Women's March comes from a place where we believe folks, we believe survivors. And we would not be here today if survivors of Brett Kavanaugh's assaults had not come forward and shared their stories. And one of them is in the crowd with us today. Shout out to Julie Swetnick. Yeah. We believe you. survivors know that coming forward is not easy. Coming forward costs us. It costs us relationships. It costs us sometimes our privacy. It costs us all of the things that the prices that too many women and too many allies and too many other people in this crowd know from a first-hand perspective. So that's why I'm happy to shout out Elizabeth Razor who is here, who stood behind and corroborated the stories of the folks who talked about Kavanaugh's abuse.
because we are all we got. And if we don't stand for each other, no one is gonna stand for us. I can't talk too much without saying that we are on occupied Piscataway land. In the same way that there are two seats occupied in this Supreme Court right now. Brett Kavanaugh's seat, his presence in the Supreme Court is a stain on our democracy. It is, is a disgrace to the institution. And we who are here will be here today, we'll be here on Tuesday, we will be here every single time that he wants to exercise his disgraceful vote in the um, attempt to implement President Trump's politics of prejudice into public policy, we will not allow it. Yeah. I'm here today because I want to impeach Kavanaugh. Yeah. <laughs> impeach? Impeach? Kavanaugh. Impeach? Kavanaugh. Impeach? Kavanaugh. Impeach? Kavanaugh. When? Now. When? Now. When? Now. When? Now. Whose streets? Our streets. Whose streets? Our streets. Whose streets? Our streets. Yeah. I'm glad it's not sunny. It feels better than that 90 degree day last year. Um, I'm Katie O'Connor. I'm senior counsel at Demand Justice, and I want to thank you all so much for being out here on this really nice fall day um, to stand in solidarity and to remind the justices of the Supreme Court that we are still watching. I know this isn't where we wanted to be, standing in front of the court again. I, like hundreds of people, many of whom are here today, stood in this very spot last year and told my own survivor story in the hopes that it would tip the scales against the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh, a man who was credibly accused of sexual assault by multiple women to the United States Supreme Court. I was heartbroken when he was confirmed, but I was also outraged. And today I'm here to channel that rage into action. Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed to the court in spite of mounting evidence that he lied under oath to the Senate, that he sexually assaulted multiple one, women, and that he's ultimately unfit to be a justice of the United States Supreme Court. Yes. And ever since his confirmation, the strength of that evidence has grown. A new book by two New York Times reporters provides hard evidence for what we already knew, that the FBI investigation into the sexual assault allegations against Kavanaugh was intentionally incomplete. Dozens of potential witnesses were ignored, and the book even suggests that there was an additional allegation of sexual misconduct that was never investigated and never made public. This wasn't a search for the truth. This wasn't a search for the truth. It was a search for political cover. Meanwhile, the 83 ethics complaints that were filed against Kavanaugh last year for potential perjury and overall lack of judicial temperament were dismissed because now, the, now that he's on the Supreme Court, the ethics rules no longer apply to him. We have the Senate and the White House to blame for the sham process that got Kavanaugh confirmed last year. But now we have the House to turn to to make it right. And make it right they must. Kavanaugh isn't fit to be a Supreme Court justice. And the longer he sits on the court, the more damage he'll do to its legitimacy and to the rights that we all hold dear. He's already met all of our expectations as a reliable conservative. Voting to allow Trump's hateful transgender military ban to go into effect, and greenlighting partisan gerrymandering that overwhelmingly benefits the Republican Party. This Supreme Court term will provide him more opportunities to strip away our rights and to strengthen those of big corporations and corrupt politicians. Now that the court has decided to hear an abortion case out of Louisiana, Kavanaugh could very well be the deciding vote to gut Roe versus Wade for good. In his confirmation hearings, Kavanaugh made crystal clear that he feels entitled to the seat that he now occupies. But no matter how entitled he feels, that seat belongs to us, the people. And we're here today to reclaim the court. Yes! The first step is to investigate and impeach Brett Kavanaugh. Yes! 
Later this afternoon, we're going to hear from Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, who's leading. She's our champion, and she's leading the fight to hold Kavanaugh accountable. I want to thank her right now for introducing House Resolution 560, calling for an impeachment inquiry into Brett Kavanaugh. We are forever indebted to her leadership on this issue, and we're calling on other members of the House to co-sponsor the resolution and to demand accountability. And I want to end by reminding Kavanaugh and all of the Republican senators that confirmed him that we are watching and we're going to keep watching. He's not fit to sit on the Supreme Court. Let's show him the door. Yeah. What's up, people? Um, <laughs> my name is Ana Maria Archila, and I am with um, my brothers and sisters of the Center for Popular Democracy and Good Nation. And um, last year, we stood, many of us who are here right now, we stood in these same spot looking out at thousands and thousands and thousands of people who had shown up to um, storm the doors of our democracy, to remind each other that democracy does not exist without us, to remind each other that it is with our stories, with our actions, with our sittings, with our protests, with our joining in community that we bring democracy alive. And we are here today, a year later, after the Senate confirmed Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court, despite the fact that he, that he had several credible allegations against him for sexual assault. Um, and despite the fact that thousands and thousands and thousands of women and people of all genders came out across the country and shared our stories of sexual assault in an effort to allow the country to see itself and to decide that we would not again repeat the history of affirming a culture that enabled sexual violence by putting people, men, who perpetrate sexual violence in positions of power. The people inside the Senate room, the Republicans and the one Democrat who voted to confirm Brett Kavanaugh failed in their ability to listen to people. And to, they failed, they failed. But the people who showed up and the women who told their stories and those of us who are here today and those people who are across the country demanding accountability for people who abused their power, they and we did not fail. I want to say to Julie, thank you. Thank you for stepping into an incredibly difficult situation and putting your body and your story on the line to allow so many of us to step into that same circle of solidarity, of courage, of imagination. Because the reason why women told their stories last year is because we believe that it is actually possible to be in a country, to build a country where sexual violence is not the norm. We believe it is possible to have a democracy where politicians listen to the people they represent. We believe, we believe it is possible to end the culture of impunity that not only enables sexual violence, but keeps rich white men in power, abusing their power and making decisions for the rest of us. I am not alone in not only believing that a new country is possible, but I am not alone in still being shocked by the inability of our elected officials to lead with moral clarity. And I think, actually, that Trump and McConnell and the Republicans who made this decision made an intentional decision. They wanted to send us a message that protest does not work. They wanted us to believe 
that it is not possible to have a country where leaders listen to their people. They wanted us to believe that their power structure on which they stand is immune to the demands of ordinary people. They wanted to reaffirm the culture of impunity that enables sexual violence and keeps them in power. But what they did not know is that when people protest and when people tell their stories and when people share in community, the, the seeds of courage and solidarity are planted so firmly in their hearts and those seeds transform society and make social change possible. <laughs> but their resistance to our future is useless. The future where women are leading, where people of color are sharing the center in this country, in our governance, is coming. That country is arriving. We are bringing it into existence with our struggle. And we are doing it by making sure that the culture of impunity does not continue. And that is why today we are saying we have to impeach Kavanaugh. Yes. We have to reclaim our courts. We have to impeach Trump. And we will bring that energy into the fight for 2020 and the future of our country. And that's why, even though people say you lost, we say no, we did not. We are changing this country, this country that is possible, the country where all of us are included is arriving. We are bringing it into existence. We are doing that today, right now. Yes, we are. I believe, and yes, we can. Survivors, say it with me. We believe survivors. 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 It feels good. <laughs> Um, my name is Tej Carson, and I am the leader of Know Your Nine. We are a survivor and youth-led organization and project that fights for high school and college-age students because young people experience the highest rate of sexual violence in this country. And I remember this time last year that I stood at the Supreme Court with a gaggle of high school-age survivors and college-age survivors about the same age that Dr. Ford and Deborah Ramirez and Julie Swetnick were when they experienced violence at the hands of Brett Kavanaugh. And we had been organizing together for a month because we knew that the, our future was on the line and that the future of young people was on the line. But I also remember the day that he was confirmed looking into the faces of those high school students as they said, what do we do now? And what does this mean now? They had been told for a month that what they had experienced when they were 16, 17, 18 didn't matter and wouldn't matter in the future. And I am so happy to see this today and hold this here today to know that what it was is that we would come together again and demand better for survivors and we would demand the impeachment of Kavanaugh. And what I remember also is hearing the stories of one woman after another coming in of the violent and disgusting action as, of, actions of Kavanaugh and thinking about the day that I learned that my closest friend had also been assaulted by my rapist. Because abusers rarely do it once and they sure as hell don't just do it twice. <laughs> but this, despite multiple um, stories against Kavanaugh, this administration, Republican senators, and the FBI didn't care and don't care to do anything. And I was reminded of a theory by Katherine McKinnon um, where she talked about how it often takes three to four women speaking out about a man's violence to even begin to make a dent in his denial. Because for credibility purposes, women are often seen as a fraction of a person. Because it takes a sea of us coming forward to demand change for anyone to ever believe us. But what is exciting today is to see a group of dedicated and powerful people united to change the course of history. 
Kavanaugh perjured himself to cover up repeated instances of sexual misconduct and violence. He is unfit to serve on the bench in a lifetime appointment. <laughs> Kavanaugh should never have been confirmed in the first place. But since he was, it's time to do right by survivors and impeach him now. Yes. I am sick of living in a country run by abusers. I am sick of the laws and decisions about my body, my rights, and my futures being made by the same people that have harmed the lives of survivors. Yeah. Our presidents, Supreme Court justices, and congressmen should not remind us of our rapists. I am here today to recommit myself to fighting against Kavanaugh because he will impact young people's lives forever, like myself and like my sister. I am demanding here today a better future for young survivors like the ones I meet every day that are simply trying to survive while abusers thrive. And I am here because I am fighting for a day where we can work to end the epidemic of violence in this country instead of having to fight tooth and nail for the most basic rights of survivors. So I want to implore you all to hold those close to you today that you are fighting for. Think of what has brought you here and what brought you here last year and drove you in this fight because it is important that we hold those people close to us while doing this work. And I wanna leave you with a quote that has really kept me going over this hard time. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. Yes. On a quieter day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you. No, thank you. You know, um, I happen to be a congresswoman, but I'm really here as a fellow survivor in solidarity, and in this moment. I find a lot these days my heart breaks and fills at the same time, and that's what's happening in this moment, because my heart breaks that we have to be here. But when I look out at all of you, my heart is so full, because you affirm that the squad is big, y'all. Yeah! So let's hear it for my fellow sisters in service gathered here today. Let's hear it for our resistors, for our persisters, for our trans siblings, for our non-binary family. Know that I see you, I hear you, and I'm fighting right alongside you. Last year, you came to Washington, many of you quite literally putting your bodies on the line. Many of you disclosed for the first time to yourselves, and then to your family, and then to complete strangers that you were a victim of this crime. And it is a crime. Many of you did that for the very first time. You chronicled the abuse and assaults you have endured because you know that those stories, as painful as they are to share, that they change the conversation. Kavanaugh may have that seat for now. But what you, what we are fighting for is so much bigger than one insecure man blinded by his privilege. You are fighting for the liberation and justice for all of us because you know that our destinies are tied. For generations, we have softened our language and moderated our tone. No more. My liberty, my humanity, my bodily autonomy is not yours yeah. to challenge. Yeah. No man, no institution, no matter how revered, will come between us and our inalienable rights. Yeah. 
Now the man's name on the posters we hold is a cog in a wheel of a broken system. And I'm not going to name him too often because I'm done gathering to give more credence and power to those who try to dehumanize and devalue our lives and our lived experiences. We gather here today to liberate survivors, to organize, to mobilize. As a survivor of childhood rape and later campus sexual assault, I spent years cloaked in a quiet shame that was not mine to bear. In acute pain, self-loathing, and it was not until I read Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings that for the first time in my life, I knew that I was not alone. Maya Angelou once said that there is no greater pain, no greater agony than bearing an untold story. I want to thank all of you who have disclosed painful stories in pursuit of justice for all of us. I continue to share my story even when my voice shakes because I know the power and the liberation of a story. And I feel the fierce urgency of upending a system that for generations has disproportionately subjected girls and women to not only these abuses, but the shame and stigma that comes with processing these violations. Today, I'm thinking of my 11-year-old stepdaughter, Cora. For as long as there is breath in my body, I will make sure a world that tolerates and normalizes assault and abuse is not the world that she inherits. <laughs> this complicit sexual assault and rape culture this broken system which devalues and dehumanizes us, it ends with us. <laughs> Employers who dismiss stories of sexual advances, HR departments who tell us to suffer in silence, it ends with us. Yeah. Elite institutions of higher education that protect the future of perpetrators while discarding the aspirations and dreams of survivors, it ends with us. <laughs> Overwhelmingly white male state legislators that systemically seek to dismantle access to abortion and put our lives in constant jeopardy it ends with us. The affluent and privileged benefiting from a shadow justice system that tips the scales in their favor, it ends with us. Whispers of doubt and degradation when we bravely speak our truth, it ends with us. Audre Lorde reminds us that your silence will not protect you, which is why we must continue to raise and to amplify our voices. When we share our stories, our pain, and our struggles, we liberate each other. Together, we will raise our voices to mobilize our communities and to legislate our destiny. I believe in the power of us. And our fighting didn't end when Brett Michael Kavanaugh put on a robe. And our fighting won't end until there is a real investigation and justice for survivors. Woo! 
I still believe Anita Hill. I still believe Dr. Christine Ford. And I believe Deborah Ramirez. We will carry our fight from the Supreme Court to the House of Representatives, to our state houses. When our civil rights and protections are on the line, we won't let up. And to my survivor squad, I hear you, I see you, I believe you, and a new day begins with us. when we decided to overtake the Supreme Court steps and I got to watch just this sea of people go around me and overtake the court. That court is ours. And today is such a powerful reminder of that. You know, I've been in the movement against sexual violence for more than six years now. I believe that one of our most sacred duties to one another as human beings and as siblings in this movement is to bear witness. To bear witness to one another's pain and fear and to hold that pain and say, what happened to you was wrong. We won't stand for this. One year ago, millions of people, not just around the country but around the world, rallied to bear witness for survivors. For Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, for Deborah Ramirez, and for Julie Swetnick, who is here with us today. Julie, you are my hero. Thank you. Thank you. For the dozens more survivors of Kavanaugh's violence who we know are probably out there, and for millions, hundreds of millions of survivors around the world who have been silenced, today we gather here again to bear witness, to bear witness to the pain and the fear that this sham of an investigation and confirmation process have caused. To hold that and to say, what happened to you was wrong. We won't stand for this. Thank you for being here again today to bear witness. And thank you for how you bore witness one year ago. One year ago, the Wednesday night before the vote, I stood before many of you right here and I said, history would tell us that these institutions, these men, that we are fighting Goliath. But who the hell is to say that we cannot be David? In that moment, I think many thought of Goliath as the vote. That was our fight. But when I said that, I knew that our fight is much bigger than one man, than one vote. We are fighting for our democracy. Our fight is to end a supremely corrupt system that prioritizes perpetrators over survivors and allows someone onto the highest court in the land while failing to thoroughly investigate them. Our fight is to dismantle the way that every major institution in this country and in this world was not built for survivors. Our fight is to say, like our sister Anna Maria did, don't look away, look at me, on behalf of survivors everywhere. Our fight is for the sanctity of our democracy. Over the past year, like many people here, at times it's been hard to maintain hope after what happened in this place. But I still believe that we are David. Recently, the New York Times revealed that more than a, after more than a year of investigating, they were able to corroborate Deborah Ramirez's allegation against Kavanaugh. Just as we suspected, it revealed that more than 25 individuals had corroborating evidence and more than seven people knew about the harassment well before Kavanaugh became a federal judge. When the FBI interviewed Deborah, they said they found, that they found her to be credible, 
but they were limited by the Senate Judiciary Committee and Mitch McConnell in how far they could take the inquiry. <laughs> what happened last year is that it should never have happened at all. If this country actually valued survivors and listened to black women, then after Anita Hill's testimony, rules would have been put in place to prevent this kind of injustice from ever occurring. If this country valued survivors, then the senators would have let the FBI do its job. It hurts to acknowledge how much this country is not built for survivors. But we can still be David. We can prevent injustice like this from ever happening again. And I know that we will. That's why NRAPE on Campus is proud to join our partners here today in calling for a full and thorough investigation by Congress into the sham nomination and investigation process, including the FBI's failure to interview corroborating witnesses, Kavanaugh's full history of sexual violence, because we know we don't know everything that's out there, and all unreviewed and undisclosed government documents related to his time in the Bush White House. There's no doubt in my mind that after all that, there will be no choice other to impeach him. But our fight isn't just about one man, or one vote, or one institution. It's about survivors, and it's about justice. That's why today I am also calling for the Senate to begin the process of creating a law, not a rules committee rule, but a law that puts a process into place to handle any allegation of sexual misconduct against somebody who is awaiting Senate confirmation for any role of any kind. We demand that whenever any candidate for any Senate confirmed role is being considered, has a credible allegation of sexual assault made against them, that the FBI is legally required to investigate before any testimony or vote. The nominating process must be halted until the FBI's investigation is complete, and neither the president nor any Senate committee, no matter which party controls it, can dictate the FBI's timeline or scope. That is democracy. The FBI must produce a report, and that report must be made publicly available before a vote takes place and can only be redacted to protect identities of survivors who don't want to come forward or top secret information. We deserve to know. We demand a process to ensure that we never have to go through the collective pain of one year ago ever, ever again. I hope that you will join me in demanding a democracy that includes centers and respects survivors. Yes. You know, in the last year, I've been thinking a lot about something that Senator Elizabeth Warren said after Kavanaugh was confirmed. Even the fights we don't win matter. Even the fights that we don't win matter. That's true because we changed the world when we stormed the court one year ago, but it's also true because the fight wasn't just about one vote. The fight to have Kavanaugh not be confirmed mattered then, and it matters today. But it didn't end one year ago. It will not end until our democracy is for survivors, too. Yeah. Yeah. Survivors, if nobody has told you today, I love you, and I believe you. We're going to win this thing. My name is Cassidy Pollard. I'm from Mason for Survivors, which is an organization at George Mason University, about 30 minutes south from here. Um, and a year ago today, I might have stood up here and told you about my personal experience of sexual violence, but I'm heartbroken from hearing survivors have to put that on blast to be heard. So I'm not gonna speak about that today. We're here today that, to demand that Congress impeach a man sitting in that court, but this goes beyond Kavanaugh and it goes beyond him sitting on that bench. Now, I mentioned that I'm from GMU. Last year, our Antonin Scalia Law School hired Brett Kavanaugh for a visiting professorship. That's not all, folks, that's not all. Brett Kavanaugh makes $25,000 per class. Our adjunct faculty struggle to make ends meet. A credibly accused professor gets a paid vacation to England to teach a study abroad course while our faculty can't make ends meet. Is that right? No! They didn't just do this. They didn't just hire him. Our former president, Angel Cabrera, endorsed this and kept it secret, attempted to kept, keep it secret, but our amazing student newspaper leaked the information to us. 
and Brett Kavanaugh's not the only one. You know, Clarence Thomas has also been known to make appearances at our law school, and Neil Gorsuch is, Gorsuch is also on the faculty. So naturally, we took action. And Mason for Survivors was born. We led a campaign advocating for Kavanaugh's resignation, as well as drastic reforms to George Mason's neg neglected Title IX department. Now, this resulted in a town hall meeting during which former President Angel Cabrera said to survivors' faces that the decision to hire Kavanaugh was more important than our well-being. I'm sure a lot of you are wondering why they would hire Kavanaugh despite the infamy he's gained. Well, remember when I said this isn't just about Kavanaugh? And remember how our law school's named after Antonin Scalia? Yeah. The law school's name was changed after a joint donation, which consisted of $20 million from an anonymous donor and $10 million from the Charles Koch Foundation. <laughs> now, Transparent GMU has done a lot of research over the past two years, and we can say with confidence that this anonymous donor had very close ties to the Federalist Society. The Federalist Society is also the body which presented Kavanaugh's name to Trump as a judicial nominee to begin with. The Federalist Society and Kavanaugh have ties to dark money such as the Koch networks. Are you starting to see how the dots connect? Yeah. Kavanaugh didn't just get put on this court. Kavanaugh, Brett Kavanaugh was manufactured by Charles Koch and Donald Trump. And their money is what put him here. Now we don't have a stake in those dark money proceedings, but they do. That's unacceptable. This is why this is about so much more than Kavanaugh. Thanks to research from Uncoke My Campus, we know that the Koch brothers have been attempting to undermine and hijack the judi judiciary across the country. And that's how you get people like Kavanaugh in this court. This has taken place across the country, but GMU, my school, is the flagship campus for this. We've received over $120 million from the Koch since 2005. And at Florida State, these donor agreements gave power over the hiring and firing of faculty, as well as input into the process of tenure. So it makes sense to assume that that's happening at GMU 30 minutes away from here as well. And it wasn't an easy process to figure this out. We had to sue our school in the Supreme Court of Virginia. And we still aren't even sure that that's gonna get us justice. You know, I shouldn't be here speaking to any of you today. I was supposed to just be a college student, go get a degree, go to class, and grow up for four years. And I'm constantly, I hear that, I'm constantly forced by my university to not just fight for justice, but to even fight for an education uncorrupted by Charles Koch. Our courts are under attack, not just by Kavanaugh, but by the Federal Society, by Charles Koch, and many others. We beg you to pay attention to George Mason and what's happening there, because if we fail to repel Koch's attempts at infiltration, it'll be way too late for anything to be done. So today, we're here to tell Congress, there's no place for predators on our courts. We want Charles Koch's meddling in higher ed and the judiciary to be brought to an end. And most importantly, that it's time to put Brett Kavanaugh out on the street. And if they refuse, it's time for you and you and you and me to run for their seats. Thank you all for coming out here. I'm ecstatic to introduce to you our next speaker, Vanessa Gonzalez from the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Now, whose streets are these? Our streets! Whose streets? Our streets! I can't hear you. Whose streets? Our streets! Thank you, everyone. You all are beautiful on this Sunday. Thank you so much. I can feel your energy, your passion, your righteousness. We are going to do this. Again, I am Vanessa Gonzalez with the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights Education Fund, and we are so happy to be here with our partners and with all of you today and throughout the year-long fight that we have all had together in arms. We saw that experience a year ago, and it was wrenching, and it just showed us clearly and painfully how deeply our institutions, who are supposed to serve justice for all, are actually embedded to only serve white men of privilege. 
we had so much energy that day and throughout the mobilization and people like you came across and mobilized every chance we got whether it was on the digital forum, whether it was taking to the streets, whether it was phone calls, whether it was marching and being arrested in the halls of the Senate. And we thank you for that. And we know it's hard to keep that energy going, but speaking as a survivor, I beg you, speaking as a mother of a daughter, who I already have to have these conversations with, and she's seven years old, that should not be the America that we are raising our children in. That should not be an America that lets a predator on the Supreme Court. When we look around and we look at the state of our country, it doesn't just start at the Supreme Court. It starts in the classrooms. It starts at our colleges. It starts at our high schools, right? When women come forward, what should we always say? We believe when immigrant women who have their citizenship status used against them and are hiding in fear, what should we say? We believe When black women come forward into a system who says you are invisible, what are we supposed to say? We believe you. And when our trans siblings come forward and they continue to be murdered on the streets, but they cried out for help before, what are we supposed to say? We believe you. Sorry. I think this is the first time I've actually stood up and announced I am a survivor. So thank you all so much for being here today. When we talk about what's at stake, as some of my amazing colleagues in the fight have said, it's not just about Kavanaugh, it's not just about this one seat. We are looking at a Supreme Court that is about to take up cases of human right and dignity. And we have two predators on that court. We have people on that court that have been actively opposed to the rights and dignity of immigrants, of trans people, who have said LGBTQ people should not get to love who they want to love. So when we talk about the power of the courts, we are not just talking about one day and one seat. We're talking about all of it. And if you don't think that the court impacts you, you are unfortunately deadly wrong. And it is time that we stand up and we take our court back. Again, let's do a call and response. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Whose streets? Our streets. Whose streets? Our streets. Thank you all so much. As was mentioned by my courageous, beautiful sister in the fight, Vanessa Gonzalez, I am Anisha Singh, Director of Judiciary and Democracy Affairs at Planned Parenthood Action Fund. <laughs> oh, I'm shaking. We're with you. This time last year, I remember standing right here, emceeing rally after rally, marching with all of you, bird-dogging and marching to the Hart Building to talk to senators, standing in the Hart Atrium with tape across my mouth that said, believe women, believe survivors, having police officer after officer come up to me and yell at me to leave and refusing to leave. And you were there too. We were all here last year putting our bodies on the line busing in from across the country and fighting with everything we had because we knew a Supreme Court seat is critically important to our health and rights. But that wasn't the only thing at stake. That fight was about immigrant rights, voting rights, LGBTQ rights, all of our rights. And yet 50 senators right there including those who profess to support and stand with women, did not allow for a full investigation of the allegations against Kavanaugh. Shame. 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 
And now we've learned the extremely disturbing news that a rush process ignored multiple serious accusations of sexual misconduct against a justice on this court. And we knew that. We just weren't listened. We weren't heard. A senators who voted for Brett Kavanaugh ignored the voices of survivors and the will of the American people, and they voted to jeopardize affordable health care for millions. They voted to put on the line the constitutional right for people to make their own health care decisions, including the nearly one in four women who have had an abortion in their lifetime. Survivors of sexual assault have the right to be heard, yes. yet they were not heard during the confirmation process. And they are not being heard now, but we are here to make sure that changes. Yes. Planned Parenthood Action Fund joins our partners in calling for a long overdue, thorough, and fair investigation of the claims against Justice Kavanaugh. Yes. A dangerous precedent for our democracy. People need to be able to trust the Supreme Court will protect their fundamental rights and freedoms. Just like the rights of immigrants and refugees to come into this country, no matter where they're from, the color of their skin, or what religion they practice. Just like the rights of workers everywhere to be treated with dignity and fairness. And just like the rights of every person in America to be able to make their own choices about their bodies. Yeah. Unfortunately, access to abortion has never been more on the line. On Friday, we learned the Supreme Court is taking up an abortion case that could decide the future of abortion access in this country and leave Louisiana with only one provider in the entire state. We need, we need to be clear-eyed about this. This is what the Trump administration and anti-abortion state politicians have been working for. A world in which abortion is inaccessible. Trump vowed to nominate justices to the court who would overturn Roe v. Wade. And as a lower court judge, Kavanaugh ruled to limit access to reproductive health care. This is not what people in this country want. In fact, 77% of Americans support access to safe, legal abortion. Planned Parenthood will fight with every tool in our, disposable, in our disposal to protect people's rights and freedoms. But let's be clear, this is beyond one case and it's beyond one seat on the court. Trump and the Republican Senate have worked tirelessly to nominate anti-abortion judges to courts across the country. In our federal appellate and district courts, more than 15% of those judges are there because of Trump. Our federal circuit courts of appeal, nearly one in four. How did that happen? Senate Republicans obstructed and refused to confirm President Obama's judges, including stealing a Supreme Court seat we are very familiar with, leaving Trump many opportunities to put people in lifetime positions who could decide on policies that affect our lives for generations to come. The stakes are high and getting higher. There are 18 cases related to abortion that are one step away from the Supreme Court at this moment. Numerous states have passed some of the most extreme anti-abortion bans in the country, including Alabama, Georgia, and Missouri. And now those very courts needed to block those bans all have judges nominated by Trump. The courts have often been our last and sometimes even our only defense against the dangerous attacks by Trump, Mike Pence, and their administration. If the Senate continues to confirm Trump's judges, the health and rights of millions of people are at risk. But know this, Planned Parenthood is going to fight with you to make sure every single judge will protect our health and our rights and your fundamental freedoms. This includes, this includes calling on that Senate to oppose Stephen Menasche, a proud ethno-nationalist nominee for the Second Circuit, and Sarah Pitlick, a nominee for the Eastern District of Missouri, who spent her entire career opposing abortion rights, condemning surrogacy and IVF, and was a loyal defender of Kavanaugh last year. These nominations and these confirmations are not an accident. And we will stand with all of you here 
today, tomorrow, and in the future, because Planned Parenthood believes survivors, we always will. And because we will protect our courts. Yeah. Whose courts? I'm Marge Baker. I'm with People for the American Way. We have 1.5 million activists around the country dedicated to fighting the right-wing extremism and building a democratic society that implements the ideals of freedom, equality, opportunity, and justice for all. Yes, justice for all. Now, we're here today on what might seem like an inauspicious occasion to mark the dark day for the American people when Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed to the Supreme Court. Now, as we've been hearing from our speakers today, the rights and interests at risk from Kavanaugh's confirmation are absolutely monumental. Reproductive justice, voting rights, LGBTQ equality, workers' rights, consumer rights, protections for immigrant rights, and the right to be protected from presidential corruption and overreach. So the dangers we face with Brett Kavanaugh on the bench are absolutely enormous. But I'm here to celebrate as well. First and foremost, I want to celebrate all of you and all of the phenomenal activists around the country. Brave, principled, engaged activists. Brave, principled, engaged women who show what it means to stand up for our core values and who fundamentally shifted the public understanding about the importance of the court in our daily lives. And we all did this because we believe them. We believe the survivors. We needed to hear their story. We are so grateful for their story. So celebrate, let's celebrate all of us here across the country who fought this fight and are continuing to fight the fight. Now, although Brett Kavanaugh is sitting on the bench, I believe, I believe, as many speakers have said today, we won. We won. We won through the energized, principled fight we waged. We won by fighting relentlessly for our values, for a cause we absolutely believed in, by fighting for survivors' right to be heard and respected. My mentor, one of my mentors, Paul Wellstone, Paul frequently said that the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And boy, do we believe in the beauty of our dreams. And we are fighting for those dreams every single day. And just briefly, we won in three other ways. We won by taking back the house. The same, the same passion, power, and energy we saw embodied in the fight against Brett Kavanaugh are the same passion, power, and energy that elected phenomenal new and inspiring members like Representative Ayanna Presley, who you just heard from, and, and put Nancy Pelosi in the speaker's seat where she is now directing the impeachment of number 45. We won for another reason. We won because the case we made against Kavanaugh and against the corrupt confirmation process that got him in his seat has no matter what put a permanent, indelible asterisk next to his name next to the name of a man who did not have the decency, the honor, the basic humanity to admit his failings, but instead blessed and participated in the most ugly, horrific gaslighting you can imagine of Dr. Blasey Ford and those who supported her. 
And that asterisk, that asterisk will get even bigger once the White House rigged FBI investigation of survivors' complaints is further exposed and the American people are able to see all, all of the documents that were hidden from us one year ago. And one, one last point. Finally, we won because we put Trump and Kavanaugh's senatorial enablers between a rock and the very hard place of the vote they took. Make no mistake, that vote is going to come back to haunt them because 2020 is the year our base, our folks, will vote the courts. The polls show that after all the heartache of what this court and the lower federal courts are doing to the lives of the American people, our base is galvanized and cares more about the courts than theirs. So my friends, this is going to be the biggest, loudest, we told you so election in history. Let me then say how honored I am and humbled to be among you and inspired to be among you. I treasure, I treasure our fight together and the movement we are building together. And again, my one very basic ask in addition to everything that we're hearing today is that all of us, all of us, vote the courts in 2020. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sheila Katz, and I'm the CEO of the National Council of Jewish Women, a 125-year-old progressive Jewish organization advocating on behalf of the most vulnerable women, children, and families here in the United States and in Israel. Tuesday night marks the beginning of Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year in Jewish tradition. It's a day of repentance for ourselves and for our communities. A time to look at, repent for our individual and our collective sins. We as a nation have a lot to repent for. We as a nation have fallen short. When the Senate confirmed Justice Brett Kavanaugh a year ago today, our country failed. We failed. We failed the millions of survivors of sexual and gender-based violence whose trauma was triggered by this grueling ordeal. We failed women by not treating their stories with the dignity and respect they deserve. We failed children who are just learning what it means to treat people with respect, to tell the truth, and act with integrity. We failed a democracy designed to undertake investigations according to rigorous protocols, not to ignore critical factors and key witnesses. That's right. Fear. We failed. As Anisha shared, we learned on Friday that the Supreme Court will soon be hearing June Medical Services versus G this term. It will be the first big abortion case since Kavanaugh joined the court that means that this man, this man who we know does not respect women or their bodies, will be deciding a case on our reproductive autonomy. And that is unacceptable. On Yom Kippur, we ask how we as a community can make things right. I'm not sure if we can ever fully repair the damage the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh has caused. But one thing is clear. A full investigation into Kavanaugh's career, confirmation, and the allegations against him are a step in the right direction. Many people have asked me why the National Council of Jewish Women supports this investigation, and my answer is easy because it matters. It matters to all of us. For the one in three women and one in six men who experience sexual violence in their lifetime, say it with me, it matters. It matters. For the children learning how to treat their peers with respect, it matters. 
For the millions of assault survivors who've been implicitly told for far too long that they either won't be believed or there will be no consequences for their perpetrator, it matters. For the constituents whose senators chose their political party over their duty by confirming Kavanaugh without a full investigation, it matters. For the integrity of our democratic institutions, it matters. For all of us for whom justice depends on our having a fair and independent judiciary, it matters. We need this investigation, and we need it now. Thank you. My name is Kadita Kenner, and I am not with a national group. I am with Why Courts Matter Pennsylvania. Any Pennsylvanians here today? Pennsylvania, all right. So I'm here today to talk to you about why it's important for us to not only protect the Supreme Court behind us, but to also protect those lower courts. Right? Courts matter? Yes. Courts matter? Courts matter! So it's so important that we protect these lower courts because where do these Supreme Court justices come from? Lower the lower courts. And I think the reason that um, I'm so happy to be here and that Demand Justice invited me to be here today, uh, CPD in the, in the Women's March, our co-conspirators in this battle, and I'm so happy that they selected Why Courts Matter to be here today. And I think one of those reasons is because we made history. We made history, not this past summer, but the summer before. We were the first organization to take folks down to DC from Pennsylvania and get arrested. And we got arrested trying to fight lower court appointments. You gotta start somewhere. And so we got arrested, which you know we, we like to call it good trouble. We know John Lewis good trouble. When right? it's time to get in the way. And so it's time to get in the way of this administration. And it's time to get into some good trouble. And so we marched down here to, to DC and we got arrested in the Capitol building. And I recommend it for anyone who would like to get arrested for the first time, very professional. So I thank the Capitol Police for their professionalism. But we did that because we need to bring attention to these lower court appointments. We were trying to stop a gentleman named David Porter. And we, stopped, we held him off for three years as an organization until finally he was confirmed. Right after Kavanaugh was confirmed. But that did not deter us and that will not stop us. We will continue to fight. We will continue to fight all these lower court appointments. Because we do know they will eventually, and hopefully not, reach that back building here. And so it's so important that we stop that. And I want to mention some successes, because a lot of times we talk about the struggle, but we don't talk about the successes. And we've had some as a coalition. Um, we've defeated Thomas Farr. Anyone heard of Thomas Farr out of North Carolina? Yeah. Jeff Mateer. Remember Jeff Mateer? Yeah. Unfortunately. And so. Right now, we're still, I know Anisha talked about this previously with Planned Parenthood, but uh, Stephen Menashe. Yeah. Stephen Menashe must be stopped. Yeah. He must be stopped, and he must be stopped because if we do not stop him, he is Betsy DeVos, and he is Stephen Miller on the court. That is what he is. And so, yes, I'm here today as part of Why Courts Matter Pennsylvania, but I know that what happens across the country affects Pennsylvania, and what happens in Pennsylvania affects all of you out there as well. And so I want you to know that there are organizations like ours out there on a state level who are fighting to protect the courts and reclaim these courts. These are our courts. These are our courts. Our courts. Our courts. Our courts. And I leave you with this, because I do come from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and one of my heroes there, Bayard Rustin. Anybody know Bayard Rustin? Yeah. He led the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. Yeah. From my hometown of Westchester, Pennsylvania. Yeah. He did it without Facebook. Yeah. He did it without Instagram yeah. or email. Yeah. And we need to make sure we continue in that vein. We need to continue in that vein. And I'm going to leave you with this. Mr. Rustin said, the proof that one truly believes is in action. And if you truly believe 
Let's get our feet to this pavement and let's not ever stop this fight to protect our courts. Hi, my name is Emily Bach and I'm 17 years old. Hi. Um, but my Me Too story began when I was 13. When I, like so many other young people, learned that I had to act like an adult. When a man more than four times my age didn't. But that began again when I saw Christine Blasey Ford's face on the front of the New York Times. Because the thing that I know that all of us understand all too well is that we don't learn about things like this in school. I grew up in a society in which my education on sexual violence was limited to one slide and a PowerPoint presentation that my gym teacher went through on her phone. I grew up in a society in which Christine Blasey Ford taught me courage, but Brett Kavanaugh taught me what it means to be a survivor in America, to be afforded only hollow definitions of justice. Because I grew up in a society where that definition permeated every part of my life, where my high school principal made jokes about sexual violence and got promoted as a result. Because I grew up in a society that teaches young people that anything short of silence is too loud. Because I grew up in a society in which so many people never have the choice to be too loud because they are never given the space to speak in the first place. Because I, like so many other survivors, grew up. And that's just it. Nobody should have to at 13. So when I think about Brett Kavanaugh, I think about the severe threat that his rhetoric poses to young people like me. But I also recognize the power of having young voices in spaces like these. So instead of repeating the words that everyone else has already said in words that would probably be better than mine, I want to say this instead. To all the young people in the audience right now listening to me speak or the ones watching this on their phones, the ones that look like me, and more importantly, the ones that don't, the young women of color, the young men, the young immigrants, the young gender expansive people. We see you, we are fighting for you, and you are not alone. Because right here, right now, I am surrounded by a sea of survivors that are bold and brilliant and exactly what we were taught not to be, loud. silence, our defiance is defined by decibels. And we owe nobody our stories, but we are owed the airspace to tell them if we choose to. So to all the young people listening to me right now, we will be your megaphone, because your words should always be loud enough. Brooke Kavanaugh is a disgrace, but he is not the problem. He is a symptom. Brett Kavanaugh is a symptom of all that is wrong with the legal profession. It is a profession that values the semblance of neutrality over justice, and that cares more about what the law lets you get away with than what is right. It is a profession in which spending a lifetime defending corporations gets you to the Supreme Court or to the President's Cabinet, but a lifetime defending the public gets you, if you're lucky, enough to pay off your student debts after 20 years. It is a profession in which defending corporations like ExxonMobil is treated as a morally neutral choice in the face of a crisis that is an existential threat to our planet. This is a profession that values collegiality more than it values any harm caused by the actions of its members. And so it watched Brett Kavanaugh's rise and shrugged. He might be bad for workers and for women, for people of color and for the LGBTQ community, but he's a carpool dad and he went to Yale Law School. In a profession that conflates power with responsibility and good character, it's not surprising that lawyers have decided that while well, sure, he might have sexually assaulted Christine Blasey Ford, he's on the bench now, so we might as well get over it. But we refuse to get over it. The Supreme Court faces a crisis of legitimacy. Confirmation did not absolve Brett Kavanaugh, and doing nothing and going back to business as usual sure as hell is not going to absolve the legal profession. It is hard to fight to restore the integrity of the court. 
It is much easier to act like this is normal. It is easier to continue to treat the justices as gods than to call out the fact that one third of the men on the bench have been credibly accused of sexual harassment and sexual assault. We still believe Anita Hill, and we still believe Christine Blasey Ford, and we still believe Deborah Ramirez. It is easier to treat Supreme Court decisions as inherently legitimate than to grapple with what it means to have decisions about women's bodily autonomy written by men who do not give a damn about women's bodily autonomy. What is easy is not what is right. Lawyers created this mess, and lawyers have an obligation to our country to fix it. So if I were Brett Kavanaugh, I would not get too comfortable in my new job. A new generation of lawyers is coming, and we will not accept this. The way the legal profession has operated for too long is ending, and it is ending now. We will restore integrity to the legal profession, and we will restore integrity to the Supreme Court. Great to see all of you here one year later. But just remember, one year ago, there were thousands of us congregated here at the Supreme Court and as that Senate across the way took the vote, thousands of us created a wave and we moved over to the Senate and then the minute that vote took place, we moved right back here. There were so many of us that Brett Kavanaugh, who was sworn in immediately, in order to avoid any more allegations from becoming public, had to go around in the back very quietly while thousands of us and thousands of you. So thank you so much for what you've done over the year. Thank you for being there then, and thank you so much for being here now. But, we will not forget, will we? No. We will not forget the sham process that led to Kavanaugh's confirmation. Never again. Never. We will not forget the Senate Republicans who hid his record Never. from the public. Shame. We will not forget Republicans who ensured that they wouldn't turn over a record, allow this candidate to mislead the Senate, allow him to carry out a temper tantrum, and then threaten revenge on all of us. We will not forget. We will not forget that Senate Republicans, the White House and the FBI, did all they could to sweep those allegations under the rug about sexual assault. And finally, we will never forget the bravery of Christine Blasey Ford, who inspired thousands of all of us to stand up and speak out. Now, a year ago, Alliance for Justice, and I'm so proud to say that there's so many of us here today from our office. Many of us um, fought along with all of you the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh. What did we know about Brett Kavanaugh when he was nominated to the Supreme Court? Well, we knew that he was a very active partner in Ken Starr's office. We knew that he wrote the impeachment report against Bill Clinton. We knew that he had gone down to Florida and been actively engaged in that Florida recount. We knew that he had gone to work for George W. Bush, and we knew that he was in charge of, of all things, picking judges in the Bush White House. But most importantly, we knew his record on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals that told all of us here 
that if confirmed to the Supreme Court, he would turn back the clock on our rights and liberties for generations to come. And sadly, after a year, he's acted as a rubber stamp for the Trump administration, upholding their racist immigration policies, allowing the ban on transgender service members to proceed, permitting egregious Republican-friendly gerrymandering, and voting to politicize the census with a discriminatory citizenship question. Despite his phony assurances that he would respect precedent, Kavanaugh has shown absolutely no indication um, and will overturn established law without hesitation. Well, no doubt, Brett Kavanaugh, Neil Gorsuch, and scores of Trump lower court judges will do such harm to the values we hold dear. But rest assured, we are, you are, and Americans are fighting back. I, I've never seen progressives as galvanized as they were during the Kavanaugh fight and one year later, that energy has not dissipated one bit. We will not forget. Yeah. But before I close, three action items important. One, Congress needs to follow up and pressure the White House and Justice Department to turn over all of Brett Kavanaugh's records. Remember. He only shared 6% of his records at his time at the White House compared to Elena Kagan, who shared 99% of her records. The House needs to press the White House to get those records and investigate. And in addition to that, the, White, the Congress, Senate, and House need to expose the cover-up engineered by the White House and the FBI in, un in conducting that FBI investigation. <laughs> Two, where are the Democratic candidates? Where are they? Every campaign stop Trump went on in 2016 he only talked about the Supreme Court. We need the Democratic candidates out there on the campaign stump talking about the courts. We need those Democrats telling the American people just how harmful these Trump judges are. These Democrats need to share their vision of justice with all of us. They need to tell us what kind of judges and justices they will put on our lower courts and Supreme Courts. And they need to promise that on day one, they will hit the ground running, losing not a moment, and start putting judges on the Supreme Court, our lower courts, who will respect and honor our rights and liberties. Let's hear from the Democratic candidates. And finally, not just the Democrats, let's show Susan Collins, Cory Gardner, Tom Tillis, and other Republicans up for re-election that there is a price to pay for putting Brett Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. Let, let's show them that we have not forgotten how they betrayed us, and equally important, betrayed their constituents. Let's send them packing and take back our courts for now and for generations to come. Thank you so much. And so I didn't expect to do this part of my little speech, but as I, was, as I was standing waiting to get on the stage, 
I thought of myself when I was 19 years old and I was raped by a former classmate from prep school. A year ago, when we were going through the confirmation process sham of Kavanaugh, I was thinking about my own experience. And just like this morning when I woke up and I was in a pretty bad mood, I was in a pretty bad mood through that week too, working with partners, but still thinking about all the women out there who is being hurt by all of this. When I watch Dr. Blasey Ford testify, as heart-rendering as that moment was, it gave me hope the same way that I feel hope right now, looking at everyone who has gathered here on this Sunday afternoon to show their support for survivors and for justice. Yeah. We believe you. So thank you. We believe you. I'm gonna repeat a lot of what everyone has said because I think the problems are pretty obvious. It's just that those in power don't want to change things because that threatens them and their ability to control people's lives. Kavanaugh should never have been nominated, let alone confirmed. But in some ways, and we all know this, someone so unqualified was really to be expected from this administration. Yes. Let's be clear. While Kavanaugh's behavior was repugnant and the Senate investigation a sham, as the speaker before me said, Brett is a dramatic symptom of a greater corruption taking over our federal judiciary. And that corruption, I'm going to put a word to it, is conservative court packing that is undermining the legitimacy of the federal courts across the country. This court packing is bolstered by the fact that ethics within the judiciary are self-policed and the Supreme Court itself is not held to any formal ethics standards. That's how Kavanaugh, even though 80 over 80 allegations of ethical misconduct was filed against him, was able to get away from all of that oversight just by getting up to the Supreme Court. <laughs> Mitch McConnell has upended norms designed to keep balance in the court for years. And now, <laughs> and now Donald Trump is remaking the judiciary in his image. His far-right extremist nominees are being jammed through the Senate and into the courtrooms that determine our basic civil rights. Brett Kavanaugh, an elite political creature willing to disrespect female senators during even his own confirmation hearing with cameras on him, is unfit to be on the Supreme Court, and we call for a full investigation, not only, not only of his own actions, but of political interference and any real investigation being carried out. But while Brett Kavanaugh is unfit, as many speakers before me have said, so too are many of the lower court nominees Trump and McConnell have elevated to lifetime appointments. Trump has appointed two SCOTUS justices and more federal appellate judges than any other modern president at this point in his presidency. We need to demand senators end this takeover. We need to hold Kavanaugh accountable. And we need to disrupt the current system so ours and our own children's lives aren't dictated by Donald Trump well past the point when he finally leaves office. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Nicole Regalado, and I believe survivors. When Donald Trump nominated Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court, Every single person on my team at Credo heard the rallying cry to fight back. We knew that the confirmation, an event of an anti-choice, anti-woman judge, would put our freedoms and rights in danger. We also knew that the confirmation of a known sexual predator would sanction and normalize the abuse that too many of our sisters have endured at the hands of predators. We came together and threw everything we had but this kitchen sink at the Senate to stop Kavanaugh's confirmation. We mobilized our members to make thousands of calls to the Senate. We showed up at Senate offices and all of us together watched every minute of Dr. Ford's courageous and powerful testimony cheering her on in California. Like many,
people here today, we fought like hell to block Kavanaugh's confirmation. So when Mitch McConnell and Senate Republicans pushed Kavanaugh through anyway, ignoring Dr. Blasey Ford, the calls for accountability from thousands of women, and the fact that Kavanaugh lied under oath in 2004, 2006, and 2018, it felt like our voices, our stories, our pain, our work, simply didn't matter. All of the women inside of me were tired. But, to, but today, as I stand here, right outside the Supreme Court, among hundreds of people who are rising up again, I am hopeful. Know that your actions here today will give thousands of people hope, and hope is one of the most dangerous threats to an administration that deals solely in hate and fear. Brett Kavanaugh is a sexual predator who has no business being on the Supreme Court for a single day, let alone for a lifetime. One year ago today, House Judiciary Chair Jerry Nadler promised that if Democrats took back the House, he would open an investigation into Kavanaugh and the accusations of perjury and sexual misconduct. Democrats won back the House in November. It is long past time for Congressman Nadler to make good on his promise. I am truly humbled to be here among you today. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, I'm Heidi Seek, the Chief Empowerment Officer of Vote Pro Choice. We were founded in March of 2016 to make sure that pro choice voters were voting in every election all the way down the ballot. One year ago today, the United States Constitution broke my heart, and I know that it broke yours too, because I was the very first member of the public who walked into the Senate Judiciary Committee room that day on the first day of Kavanaugh's hearings. Who was there with me? Jenna was there. Look at who was there oh, for those three weeks we were out there. You know, there were hundreds of us that showed up before we even heard the stories of Dr. Christine Blasey Ford and Debbie Ramirez and Julie Swetnick, who is right here. Right here. They came to tell the story of who Brett Kavanaugh was, but we already knew who he was. We knew. We knew. The guy was like a, a political operative, A, drunk on power and privilege, B, and clearly drunk on a lot of beer, if you remember that testimony. I mean, seriously. Now, okay, so I am a 48-year-old woman. I, was, I grew up in Nebraska in the 80s. I am a sexual assault survivor, just like many of you. Like one in four pregnant people, I chose to abort a pregnancy. I have absolutely no shame or regret about that. But I have worked in politics and reproductive freedom for 30 years to make sure all of you and everyone else can feel the same way about their choices. And let me tell you, you know, I have, I have seen some shit in my life. And I'll be honest, I'm really worried. Not only because we could lose Roe v. Wade within the year because of these people, but also because the checks and balances of the United States Constitution, which were put in place, y'all, by a small number of white slave owners, basically, to check their own privilege, those checks and balances aren't really working anymore. And that's terrifying, you know? But guess what? We do have some checks and balances. Do you know what they are? They're us right here. That's why we have to just, I love the Women's March and the Center for Popular Democracy and Demand Justice and NARAL Pro-Choice America and all the amazing partners who came out today to make sure that we can check and balance this court and this federal corrupt, this corrupt federal government.
because you know what else we have for checks and balances? We have our voices and we have our vote. So I need you to remember, 77% of this country believes that there should be reproductive freedom in America. That is Republicans, Democrats, Socialists, yes. Independents, you name it. We believe that we should be free. That means that we have more votes than the anti-choice minority responsible for that. We have more votes. That means we have more voices than the Fox News Facebook propaganda machine. We have more voices. That means we have more power than they do. And do you wonder why they want to suppress us? Ah. But guess what? This is what I really want you to know. This is your call to action. In less than a month, November 5th, 2019, there are 49,000 races on ballots in 34 states. Five states have statewide elections and thousands of municipal races are on the ballot. You know what you need to do in each of those races? Vote. Vote. Seriously. Because it's not about 2020. It's not about praying for impeachment. It's about taking action right now. And we need to be electing local judges, local pro-choice public defenders, district attorneys, city council members, mayors, because you know how we got Kamala and Ayanna? By voting in local elections. They started there. So my friends, we, you have to promise me, on November 5th, 2019, you're gonna do what? Vote. And you're gonna vote pro-choice. Yes, because we've done all the work for you. Just go to voteprochoice.us. We've done it all. Because listen, if you don't want the perpetrators in charge, we have to put the survivors in charge. I love you all so much. Yes, and that's what we're going to do. Good afternoon, Washington, D.C. Hello. I, again, am Alana Solomon, and I'm so proud to be here with you all to stand with you who not only knew since day one that Brett Kavanaugh was unfit to serve as a Supreme Court Justice, but you helped spark unprecedented activism by millions of people who refused to sit by and let men like Kavanaugh decide the fate of reproductive freedom in America. We have all known since day one that Kavanaugh would work to gut Roe v. Wade to criminalize abortion and punish women. We watched him tell lie after lie after lie to the public, under oath to the Senate Judiciary Committee about everything from his determination to gut Roe v. Wade into his history of committing sexual assault. So today, on this painful anniversary, let us mark this day with a commitment to fight for real investigations, to fight for real accountability, and to fight for Kavanaugh's removal from the bench. <laughs> to make no mistake, a Kavanaugh Supreme Court does present unprecedented threats to Roe v. Wade and our most fundamental freedoms to make our own decisions about pregnancy. An emboldened, anti-choice minority has pounced on this opportunity to gut or overturn Roe now that Kavanaugh's on the bench. They're pushing abortion bans all over the country in 30 states this year alone, but that is not where the story ends. Public support for Roe is at an all-time high, and more than 7 in 10 Americans support access to abortion. That means we are the majority. And in response to the grave threat that Canada represents on the court, eight states so far this year alone have passed laws to protect the right to abortion and expand access to abortion because we are the majority. <laughs> so what are we gonna do with this power, folks? We are gonna organize. Let's hear you say it. What are we gonna do with this power? We organize. We demand a full investigation into Kavanaugh. We will continue to fight with everything we've got to defend every person's freedom to make the best decision for themselves about how, if, and when to raise a family. But we do not stop there because November 2020 is coming. To all the senators who voted for Kavanaugh, we see you and we remember. So on this anniversary, let us also double down on our commitment to defeat Trump, to take back the Senate, to defend the House, help elect pro-choice champions up and down the ballot so we have no more Kavanaugh's. Together we are stronger, together we will win! Ooh. Ooh. 
Ashe family, Ashe, we've come to the end of this portion. Um, it's a hard time. It's a hard time to be a queer black woman in America, let me tell you. It's a hard time to talk about justice in reference to the criminal legal system. This last week we saw an admitted killer get 10 years in prison for slaughtering an unarmed black man in his own home. And we watched that judge who sentenced him hug, sentenced her hug that murder her. And my heart said, why can't black folks receive the same kind of love, the same kind of compassion, the same kind of forgiveness that white folks seem to get in this system? And my heart hurt. My heart hurt because I knew that not just in the criminal legal system, but in every court that is supposed to administer justice in this country, all the way up to this Supreme Court, the deck is stacked against freedom. And then I knew I was coming here to be with y'all, folks who I consider family. Many of you I have sat in those halls with, I have been arrested with, I have ate meals with. Some of you I haven't met in person, but we're Facebook friends. <laughs> All of your energy feeds me and gives me life. So I'm gonna start with something that's comfortable for me, which is saying thank you to the sheroes, the heroes that have touched me so much over this last year and that have brought us all here together, really. Thank you first. Thank you first. Thank you first. To the people with disabilities and the immigrants and the women and the indigenous folks, those were the first people who said, something isn't right here and we need to stand up. You know, a year ago in September, I was actually supposed to be on vacation. I was supposed to be celebrating my wedding anniversary. Instead, I was in jail. <laughs> I remember at 6 a.m. lining up and people saying, you're not going to be able to do civil disobedience in a Supreme Court hearing. But my, my sister, Linda Sassora, said, watch us. And as hundreds of us packed that hearing, she stood up and she said, this is a sham and it is intolerable. And so we didn't tolerate it. Person after person after person got up, said their piece, engaged in civil disobedience and change the conversation across the country forever. And then we found out about Dr. Ford's allegations. Not allegations, let me get that back. We found out about her truth. We found out about her truth. So, what I'll say is you never know where your inspiration, where your bravery, where your protection, where your community will come. I certainly didn't know on that first day as I was the second woman arrested being dragged out of that hearing room on the ground by, I think it was four, maybe five officers at that time, because I'm strong. I didn't know how many women would come forward with their stories, how many women would tell their truths, how connected we would all be. So I'm gonna ask you to do something uncomfortable I'm going to ask you to receive some praise for yourself. So I want you to just look at your neighbor before I close out. I want you to look at them and tell them thank you. Tell them you appreciate them being here. Tell them you're glad to be a part of their squad and in this community. Ashe, this is beautiful. You remind me that change, it never comes from this place. And it never comes from over there. Change comes from us standing up and deciding that we deserve more. Deciding that we deserve the world of our dreams. 
deciding that our families deserve the freedom to thrive. Just like generations before us who were told no, who were told we didn't matter, who were told we weren't deserving of the rights we were given on the day we were born, not by some court, but by the universe. That is where change comes from. And so I'll ask you to do one more thing with me, which is to raise your right fist if you're able, and then ask your neighbor for consent to place your left hand on their shoulder. It's okay if you don't want to be touched, just say no, we don't mind. We like enthusiastic consent. I'm going to leave you and I'm going to ask you in the, in the beautiful tradition of call and response that comes out of the black community, I want to ask you to echo these words of Asada Shakur, our freedom fighter. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and support one another. We must love and support one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose. Again, but our it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty. Thank you so much for being here.